Hello everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton. Today what I want to talk about is the idea of Messiah and the problem that I have with the notion of the Messianic doctrine that is articulated by those Jewish apologists critical of Christianity. Now, when I say Judaism's Messiah in this context, I want it to be clear that I'm talking very specifically about this idea of the Messiah that is promoted in the literature of groups like Jews for Judaism, which generally follow a very, what I would call, minimalist interpretation of someone like Maimonides. Judaism itself, not only before, but also after Christianity, contains many resources which I would suggest um, are open towards a much more... Christian idea of the Messianic Age and what the Messiah does. We might call it a more spiritual idea of the Messiah. Some of the Messianic theology of the Lubavitcher Rebbe and Chabad in general are very amenable to this, in my opinion, but that's not really my argument here. My argument is specifically with those who engage critically with Christianity. Now, before I get into the main subject of the video, I just want to mention briefly, if you enjoy this channel and you want to support it, please consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member. At $20 and up uh, on Patreon, I guarantee... Uh, at least one hour of one-on-one -on -one discussion per month if you'd like to take advantage of that. Many people have said they found it very helpful. There's also exclusive content that I've done with Ubi Petrus, and there's some other content that's available at the other tiers, so I prefer to keep things available to a general audience. Um, and if you would like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call on a one-time basis, you can simply send me $25 on PayPal, linked below, and just include your email in the uh, PayPal uh uh, message so that I can send you my email address with the link to the calendar where you can arrange a call. Uh, so with all of that said, let's get into the subject of today's video. So here's the central problem, as I see it, with uh, what I'm calling here traditional Judaism's Messiah, as it's unpacked and explained by those exponents of the Jewish tradition who engage critically in an apologetic context with Christianity. So according to this view, the Messianic Age will be publicly and irrefutably manifested because of three main things. First, the Jewish people are going to be regathered from exile. The second, all nations will confess the one God. That is, all the Gentiles will confess that there is one God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And third, there's going to be a universal dominion of peace, and the nations will cease to make war. So I'm going to set aside the idea of the exile and the regathering from exile for now. I've discussed it in other videos, and I agree, in fact, that exile is the major theme of Scripture. Adam is exiled from Eden, uh, and the return from exile marks the end of the Pentateuch, just as the exile from Eden marks its beginning. But we're going to set it aside for now. Judaism, as I understand it, affirms the reality of free will. You've got a good inclination, and you've got an evil inclination, and it's up to you to choose deliberately between the two of those. It's the duty of man to exercise his will in such a way that it is faithful to God and in accordance with the good instead of the evil inclination. So for the traditional Jew who affirms free will in this sense, uh, he faces a very serious problem, in my opinion, when he deals with the concept of who the Messiah is and how the Messianic age is actually brought about. So the concept of the Messiah that I've just summarized here and that you'll find on in the literature of Jews for Judaism, who say that Jesus is not the Messiah because look at your window, there's not peace and, and so forth. Uh, in, in this concept, the fundamental problem is really one of knowledge. Um, the nations simply are not aware that uh, God is understood by traditional Judaism is the only embodiment of the genuine revelation, or the genuine covenant that the God of Israel made with the people of Israel. Apart from a very small number of Gentiles who participate in the Noahide movement, and it's important to understand that covenantally, in Judaism, all Gentiles are Noahides by birth. Noahidism, as a movement, does not exist as a corporate movement with distinct worship and tradition. It is merely Gentiles who have chosen to, uh, to worship God in accordance with um, his description in Judaism. But apart from those Gentiles who are in the Noahid movement and those who convert to Judaism, uh, all the nations have varying degrees of misconceptions about reality. There's disputes in Judaism about whether something like Islam is what they call a vodazar or idolatry, but it is agreed that there are certain misunderstandings that they have about what God wants from mankind, including what he wants from the children of Noah. Either these nations crudely worship idols, or they worship God with an inaccurate view of his relationship with mankind and the history of his engagement with mankind. In this view, what the Messiah does is, through his supernatural work, he confirms the faithfulness of God to the Jewish people within the covenantal framework of Orthodox Judaism. 
Such supernatural confirmation provides empirical and objective verification to all the nations of the world that the Lord alone is God and that Israel, serving God through Torah in its rabbinic interpretation, is his people. The Messiah provides good judgment, he resolves conflicts about the interpretation of the Torah, and he brings war and idolatry to a conclusion among Jews and Gentiles alike. But my question is whether this is spiritually plausible. I believe that this raises very serious problems, given what we read in the Torah itself about mankind. In the Torah, we read that Pharaoh continued to harden his heart, even as the miraculous provision of God for the Jewish people increased. No matter how self-evident it was, how direct the revelation of God had become, Pharaoh continued in his rebellion and even intensified that rebellion. Perhaps one might try to suggest, though I don't agree, that this is more complicated because of the issue of who is hardening or strengthening Pharaoh's heart. But let's set that aside then for the sake of the argument. What about Israel? What about Israel herself? When Israel comes to Mount Sinai, she beholds the God of Israel descend in an objective and terrifying glory upon the mountain. The basic framework for the Torah covenant is publicly announced in the ears of all the people. Moses' prophetic calling is empirically verified in an irrefutable way, thereby affirming that Moses is the divinely anointed messenger through whom the Torah is given to all Israel. The covenant is formally sealed and affirmed through representative elders, and yet within 40 days of his ascent, Israel is worshipping a golden calf. And indeed, when God does speak directly to them, they don't like it. There was no shortage of empirical verification. And yet, she rebelled. And the problem extends even before the Sinai revelation. At the Red Sea, after amazing and visible plagues on all Egypt, when the glory of God is before their very eyes, Israel is still muttering that Moses brought them out to die in the wilderness. After the covenant, after the covenant renewal, after Egypt is destroyed and while the glory of God is present to the whole nation from dawn to dusk, Israel still rebels. Israel cries out against God and Moses out of fear of the Canaanites, despite having just seen God strike Egyptian civilization down with his own hand. Matters as trivial as being bored with food bring Israel to rise up in rage against Moses and God. The very blessing, the very supernatural preservation of their life through manna from heaven itself becomes an occasion for grumbling and rebellion because it's boring. Now, this is not a case that is made uniquely against the Jewish people. Israel, in her story, does not distinguish herself from the nations. What she does is she embodies the psychological and spiritual condition of the nations. Mankind does not rebel or disbelieve because God has hidden himself. Man may claim such when God hides himself, but at those moments when God visibly and plainly and obviously discloses his name and character, mankind still turns up his nose. And so the problem with Judaism's Messiah in this understanding is that everything we know about mankind, from the Torah, from the prophets, and from human experience, everything we know tells us that God could write, I am God, I alone am God, stop this foolishness in the stars tonight, announcing it in every language directly to all nations, and the next morning we would see scores of people declaring that aliens had finally manifested themselves to the human race, and that the reality of God had been refuted by such a discovery. There is a deeper problem in the human condition than mere ignorance. And the Torah bears grave witness to this fact. Judaism's Messiah, even if he empirically verified the truth of Judaism to all nations, could not succeed in the short time span thought to be the distinctive marker of the transition to the Messianic age. Israel's story is not one of failure and constant rebellion, however. Her story is more complex. While worshipping idols in the crudest possible way during the period of the Judges, eventually the nation began to digest what God had spoken to them in the Torah. During the age of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, idolatry continued to exist, but it was much rarer. More common was the worship of the one true God, but in forbidden ways, on high places. And with the exile and return from Babylon, the Jewish people ceased to even worship on high places. They worshipped the one God according to his liturgical instructions at the central sanctuary, thus bearing witness of the one Lord and King to the nations among whom they lived. What happened at this point in her history, 40 years before the fall of the temple, 
is where Orthodox Judaism and Orthodox Christianity part ways. But we can both see that there was change. Slowly but surely, God was molding his chosen nation. But compare the census provided at the beginning of the book of Numbers with the census figures providing at the beginning of the book of Ezra. The Jewish people had been put through a refiner's fire, and what had emerged had been purified. It became a worthy vessel for the divine purpose of the Most High, for the sake of all creation, but it was reduced to a fraction of what it was in the process. As Isaiah 6 describes, God whittled Israel down to a remnant and then whittled her further. As it says in Isaiah 27, before Israel shoots forth to bless the whole world with fruit, it is gleaned out one person by one person. How did this happen? If this is what it took, a thousand years with most bloodlines disappearing to gain a people faithful to the Torah, then how could the prophetic word come true? How could all nations flow to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Universal peace, swords into plowshares, with a thousand years and such a cost, and no lack of direct, miraculous, and empirical verification of the divine commandments through Moses and the prophets, how could we expect all nations to be gathered to the one God in the short time span that traditional Judaism in this understanding provides for the accomplishment of the messianic task? And this is why I find the Christian interpretation of history to be far more compelling and far more consonant with the Torah's own witness to what human beings are and what our problem is. This doesn't prove that Jesus is the Messiah. To prove that Jesus is the Messiah requires more direct evidence. It requires careful engagement with everything written in the Torah and the prophets. But in my view, what this does show is that there are very serious problems, given what the Torah itself says about the pattern of human life and the nature of human rebellion, with this understanding, at least, of the rabbinic concept of the Jewish Messiah and the short time span for his mission. Now, in the Christian view that I think scripture sets forth, Jesus as Israel's Messiah secures in his own person the resurrection of the dead, the inheritance of the nations, and the circumcision of the heart through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is enthroned and reigning now from the heaven of heavens, and the divine work for the healing of all nations from idolatry, the gathering of the entire human family into one people with many languages, many tongues, many songs, that work proceeds apace. Producing a small faithful remnant among the Jewish people took a thousand years from the Torah covenant to the return from Babylon under King Cyrus. Now God's work is much more ambitious. No longer a mere remnant, but all nations. The dispersed human family, which had united around the idolatrous altar of Babylon in its early history, shall ultimately be united around the one faithful altar of Zion in the continuing unfolding of the Creator's wise purpose of the world. This story is anticipated in the book of Genesis. In the uh, event of the flood, God commanded Noah to gather all kinds of seed and bring them into the ark. And then we're told that a flood came across the whole face of the world. That's judgment by water. And there was a small remnant of the human family, only eight people who survived. At the end of the book of Genesis, however, we hear something different. Then when we have a judgment by fire, by the famine that comes from heaven, we don't have just seed brought into the ark. We don't have a small family. We don't have a remnant. What we have is Joseph enthroned among the Gentiles, betrayed by his own brothers, yet reconciled to his own brothers in the end, uniting them in peace with the Gentile nations of the world, feeding all of them, not with seed, but with a great and abundant harvest of bread. Where the water from heaven came on the whole face of the earth in the flood, now we're told that a famine came across the whole face of the world. Egypt is a living ark which Joseph, to which Joseph is Noah. And indeed, the Messianic king in Genesis 49, 8 to 12, is described in the very terms that Joseph is described from Genesis 37. We're told that Joseph's brothers will bow, uh, bow down to him, and we hear the same of Judah's uh, descendant, the Messianic king in Genesis 49, 8 to 12. From a remnant to all nations, from a small fraction of the human family to the whole human family united and given peace, that is the ambition of God in the world. And 2,000 years ago, the New Testament was written. Its central subject, Jesus the Nazarene, was to most who were acquainted in passing with him, nothing but a strange curiosity. A Jewish prophet, wonder worker, crucified, executed. His disciples bizarrely claimed he'd been resurrected from the dead in a glorified body. And there were a few 
from among the Jews and from among the Gentiles who believed. But at the time the New Testament was written, what we today call Christianity was a relatively obscure cult from the East. And in the midst of this obscurity, the authors of these texts proudly declared that this crucified Jew was Lord over all nations, that all would bend the knee to him. They claimed that he reigned from a throne in the heavenly places and that this would be affirmed in his subduction of all nations to himself, in his defeat of his enemies, and in the proclamation of his name throughout all the earth. A strange claim, to be sure, in light of the marginal nature of the early church. And yet, in 2022, here we are. The claims made of Jesus of Nazareth in the New Testament were not made in light of a profound and unexpected success among the Gentile peoples. It was not as if so many Gentiles began to be compelled by this Jewish teacher that some Jews thought he might be the one through whom God would make known his name to the nations. No, at the time of the writing of these books, the cult was obscure, and there was even evidence of its fragmentation. See, for example, the controversy over the Judaizers and the Gnostics and so forth. And yet, the apostles made these claims. They said that this was the one in whose name God would be made known. Three centuries later, the emperor of the Romans declared that idolatry would be obliterated from the Roman state, refusing to sacrifice from the old gods who'd been worshipped for over a thousand years, and declaring that the Roman Empire would celebrate the one God who had elected Abraham, brought Israel from Egypt, and sent Israel's prophets. And the emperor of the Romans proclaimed that this God was the one true God in the name of the Jew who was crucified and proclaimed as enthroned among this relatively small and obscure community of passionate followers three centuries earlier, Jesus of Nazareth. That many believe that Jesus is indeed the Jewish Messiah is no proof, of course, that he is such. Such a case would have to be made through direct and careful engagement with Israel's scriptures, and I think it can be made. I have several... Uh, I'll, many hours of discussion on this channel about why I think he is the Messiah. But in light of what I explored above concerning the deep implausibility of the idea, given human nature and our tendency towards rebellion in the face of God's obvious self-disclosure, given the implausibility of this notion that the messianic work of illumining and healing the nations could take place in an historical instant, his claim to be Israel's Messiah has a certain plausibility to it. Every Passover season, thousands of Gentiles journey to Jerusalem. We're so used to this that we don't recognize how incredible it is. If it is true that the Messianic age can be seen from out your window, look out your window and watch Gentiles descended from German idolaters, descended from, uh, from Italian idolaters, descended from all kinds of Gentile idolaters, watch them profess the name of the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, study Israel's scriptures, and go to Jerusalem to celebrate a Jew whom they identify as the Messianic king. His identity as the Messiah demands consideration. Billions from the nations at least make the claim to worship the one God of Abraham, influenced in one way or another by the historical impact of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, to be sure, the peace and universal dominion that is spoken of in Israel's prophets has not yet unfolded in its fullness, or near its fullness. But that is not true because of a low truth about the impact of Jesus on history, but because of the high horizons to which the prophets point, and which Jesus himself reaffirms. As John Ortberg has explored in multiple books, the world has without question been brought nearer to sanctification through Jesus. There are steps forward in history, and there are steps back. But consider where the people of Israel's God were 2,000 years ago, and what Jesus of Nazareth meant to most people then. Comparing that with the name Jesus of Nazareth today, one can see that the prophetic vision a vision which could not take place in anything other than ages of time has moved forward and continues to do so in the name of one person. That's Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of Israel. The guarantee of the future success of the church is in the faithfulness of God and making its proclamation heard in the past. A long future for the church is a message of hope, not of despair. For it is the God of hope who, is, who does not cast away the world in disgust, nor do only the bare minimum. The superabundance of his grace, more than anything we might ask or think, brings, as the book of Revelation describes, the healing of the nations. In light of the possibility, and even probability, of this long future, Paul's words in Ephesians 2, 4-7 gain new depth. But God, being rich in mercy, 
because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with the Messiah, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in the Messiah, Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in the Messiah, Jesus. The revelation of the grace of God occurs in the reality that the time of grace is not a brief window for escape from a collapsing and doomed world, but is in a mystery of the coming ages in which the gifts given are truly immeasurable. So if you're undecided about this question, I just ask that you ask God. And I'm not saying that he'll respond by giving you a burning in your bosom, but ask God to lead you to those things which would clarify and make known what it is that he wants, whether you're Jewish or from the nations. I hope you found some insight from this video, and I hope to speak with you again sometime soon. Please pray for me. Please have me commemorated in the Divine Liturgy if you are Orthodox, and I will see you next.